If we think about ourselves when, when we get angry, uh, when we have difficulty self-regulating, what's that about? It's soft and about unpredictability. So you've set up your week to look like this and somebody's changed it, then that kind of thing can start us to have difficulty self-regulating. So any kind of unpredictability, and then there's your personal frustrations. You know, there's certain things that certain people hate, certain words that people use that really inflame some people and not other people. So we've got unpredictability, we've got personal frustrations, we've got substance use, you know, if somebody's intoxicated. So that could be an external chemical, um, an illicit substance, could be alcohol, it could also be medication. So if somebody's on a, a new medication, if somebody's starting a new antidepressant, for example, feel a little bit wobbly for a few days, um, at that point it would be hard to self-regulate, it'd be hard to control this stuff. Other things are things like mental illness, physical illness, any kind of pain, discomfort, being away from your loved ones, being away from your home, not being in control of what's happening. Then if you look at that cluster of things that would lead us to have difficulty self-regulating, then you look at any hospital bed anywhere in the world, that patient is going to be ticking most of those boxes. Their visitors coming in are going to be ticking most of those boxes. So we see quite a lot in the healthcare environment of people being triggered by things that sometimes staff members don't realise. You know, if you've been a staff member here for lots of years, sometimes we forget what it would be like to be that patient or to be that visitor. So sometimes in itself, being a patient or a visitor is enough to trigger this stuff. Um, and it's going to be slightly different for everyone. It's really about change. So if we can get a, a benchmark of what somebody's normally like and then we start to see that change happening, then that's what we're looking for. So any kind of escalation, any change in their voice, their expression, their muscle tone, things like that, we start to see that coming up. It usually comes from fight or flight. So when the person's looking quite calm and relaxed and then you see a bit of a startle response to something you've said, then that may be a sign that there's fight or flight coming through there. So trying to pick that and recognise it for that particular person. That's really dependent on us being able to build rapport with that person. So if that's a visitor or a patient or a colleague, um, knowing that person, knowing what they normally look like, gives you a bit of an idea when there's a bit of a change happening. But it really is change. When you start to see the change happen, it's just recognising that and doing something about it. The outward signs tend to be unique to that person. So there's this classic picture of what an aggressive person looks like, but not everybody looks like that. So again, we're looking at changes. We're looking at changes in volume of voice. So some people, when they get angry, when they escalate, they start shouting. Some people get quieter. Language can change. Some people will swear more. Some people will use different sorts of sentence formation. Some people will be antagonistic in their choice of words. Another language change is that some of your patients, some of their family members, don't have English as their first language. So they may start speaking more English or more of their first language. And the key there is trying to see if we know that person and have built rapport with them. I'm hoping that staff will recognise that when they look and sound like this, that's them escalating. Other things are pacing, eye contact. Sometimes people clenching their fists is a bad sign but sometimes people clenching their fists is a good sign. Uh, there are some people who have had problems with anger management and they might go and see counsellors, psychologists, and one of the activities the psychologist might help them to use is tighten up your muscles, tighten up your fists and release the muscles to get the energy out to help you to relax. So if we see somebody clenching their fists and just assume that that means they're angry, then sometimes we're going to get that wrong. So again, building rapport with that person, knowing that, it gives you an in to understand it. One of the ones that I personally look for is muscle tone. So when the person's relaxed, sitting like this, we say something to them and the shoulders come up or they change their posture or of course they get up and they start walking towards you. But that first change in muscle tone is usually a sign that fight or flight's starting. Um, if we can catch that early, 
we've got more chance of helping that person to regulate. If we wait until later, until they actually get up and start pacing and walking towards us, then we've missed an opportunity. So there's a whole range, and as I said at the beginning, it is unique to everyone. Um, but if we know that person, we can start to guess when they're escalating, when they're not. The first thing is to intervene early. Don't let the person build up momentum and get further into their threat or their intimidation or whatever it is they're doing. Try and pick a, a phrase or a sentence that you're going to use and just stick to that. And don't get drawn into debates. Don't get drawn into debates about what was said and what was meant and what the intention was. So as an example, uh, if there's a staff member and I'm visiting my wife here, my wife's one of your patients, I ask the staff member for something and they say no. And that infuriates me. And I keep on pushing the staff member quite rightly, keep saying no because that's the right answer. And I say, I know what time you finish. I know where you've parked your car. It's going to be dark when you're walking to your car tonight. You should be really careful. Some people fall over and hurt themselves in the dark. If we were to then open up a debate about is that a threat, is that not a threat, then we're losing time there. As soon as I say, I know what time you finish, the staff member says, we're not having that conversation, Mr Jeffrey. I want to help you here, and you move on. If we get drawn into a debate about that was a threat, you can't threaten me, then that's taking you down a whole different conversation pathway. So just sticking to the basics, intervene early, get a short phrase that isn't going to open doors to a debate, we're not having that conversation, Mr Jeffrey. I'm here to help, and then move on with that conversation. Having a bit of a discussion with the staff that are going to be in that environment that that person's coming into, uh, developing some kind of plan about how we're going to handle it. One of the concerns here is you don't want it to be a self-fulfilling prophecy. Oh no, Mr Jeffrey's coming in again, he will be violent. And then everybody that Mr Jeffrey sees is all standing to attention looking scared. That can become a self-fulfilling prophecy, it can cause me to escalate. If I've got a track record, a history of being aggressive, then if we have got a plan and we're thinking which staff members would be the best staff members to receive me when I come in, what area should we be in, are there going to be any other patients around? I suppose the ultimate option here is if we are really concerned, then perhaps we go for that planned Code Grey, where we contact security, contact the Code Grey team in advance. Brian Jeffrey's got an appointment this morning at 10.30. There's a chance that he may be as aggressive as he was previously. Is there any chance of us getting some kind of support here, just in case? Focusing on safety, first of all, uh, being aware of the personal space. Uh, personal space for the staff member and for the aggressor or the potential aggressor. Um, bearing in mind that some people who have experienced trauma, for example, need just that little bit more space because their, their brains are hypervigilant, hyper aroused and they feel more threatened. So getting that physical space right would be a first thing. Understanding how your body looks, so what's your body communicating. If you're trying to de-escalate someone by standing over the top of them, that's never going to be working. So being aware of how you stand, where you stand, still trying to have a, a professional posture, not being too relaxed, but having a professional stance that, that communicates assertiveness, professionalism, but it also gives you an opportunity to protect yourself if need be. So you don't want to be standing like that, but being able to get to that stance when you're ready. So for me, the, the, the stance that I prefer to use is having my feet um, at L shape, having my knees bent. I tend to have my hands in front of me, and rather than looking at the person, I would be sitting or standing at an angle from them and choosing to look at them. So they're seeing the side of me rather than the full front of me. After that, we'll start to think about how we, how we talk. I, I would want to get the person talking. Uh, we have to listen actively while they're talking. So rather than taking the conversation down different pathways, just try and keep them talking. Oh really? I didn't realise that. Okay. Just to keep them talking in the same direction. The key to this is trying to find out what's wrong. 
So the person that's shouting and screaming because they've, their appointment's been delayed, that tends not to be what they're angry about. That's the thing that's pushed them over the edge today, but there's usually some anger underneath that. And if we can listen long enough to get to that, then we can start to help. Once we've achieved that, a little bit of empathy helps. One of the problems with empathy is we're trying to say, I understand. But if you do say, I understand, the person's likely to come back at you saying that you quite clearly don't understand. <laughs> and there can be quite a lot of volume and conflict in that conversation. So if we're trying to get the message over, I understand, then we're using empathy statements like, I didn't realise, that must have been so difficult. Of course you're angry. I can see how angry you are. You've got every right to be angry. Those kind of phrases. If we can use a genuine empathy phrase, then that helps the person to believe that they're being heard. It becomes more of a conversation. And once it becomes a conversation, then we can start to look at solutions. One of the solutions can sometimes be a negotiation. So the person's demanded something and it's against the rules, we wouldn't negotiate there. But if somebody's requesting something and it's a fair request, then we can do the negotiation. One of the concerns about negotiation is that if you negotiate with someone who's angry and who's doing the dominating stuff, when you negotiate, you're rewarding this energy, this behaviour. If you negotiate with someone who's requesting something, then you're rewarding this behaviour. So the negotiation is definitely an option, but we just need to remember that if you negotiate with someone, there's a chance that you're going to be rewarding whatever behaviour they were presenting with. The last part is unfortunately sometimes the part that people forget, which is the debrief. After an incident like this, we often go straight to other patients and their family members and debrief them about the, the loud voices and how scary it was. I think that sometimes in healthcare, we forget to debrief the staff. Sometimes we forget to debrief the staff that overheard it and that were scared about it. So just remembering to do that at the end, it just helps to tie it up and make it safe before we move on to whatever else we have to deal with. It's ultimately about safety. Um, my concern from an OHS perspective is staff safety, but staff safety also provides patient safety, visitor safety, general safety. When we're coming into a room, we should be looking before we come into a room and you see what's happening in the room before you choose to walk in. But as you walk in, if there's only one way into the room, there's only one way out of the room. And you need to, to try your best to keep your head up and be aware of where that exit is. So for the staff safety, having the, the exit closer to you than it is to the, the potential aggressor, but also for that person's safety, not blocking their exit to the door because we don't want to escalate them by having them feel that they're trapped. So for me, when I'm coming into a, a space, a clinical space or otherwise, it's looking at the exits, looking at where the furnishing is, having a, a decision about what locale are we going to have this conversation in? I'm quite happy having the conversation with my back to the door, walking towards the person, but I'm going to be on an arc, a safe arc, around that person. I'm not going to get in close to them, because getting in close is potentially going to be where the danger is happening. Sometimes when people come into a space like that, clinical or non-clinical staff, they're so busy, they've got so many tasks and activities to take care of, that they forget their orientation. They forget where the door is and then they can find themselves in a corner with a, a patient or one of their visitors standing between them and the door. So the key is really trying to keep an eye on where the exit is and navigate your way around it. One of the phrases that I use a lot is hope for the best, plan for the worst. The vast majority of people would never dream of hurting you. But occasionally you're going to come across someone who does. If you hope for the best, assume that everybody's going to be nice but plan for the worst, just in case I've got this wrong, where's my exit? And that's not just about the workplace, that's when you're walking home from the pub, that's when you're out socialising. Hope for the best, plan for the worst, gives us a little layer of protection. During the de-escalation, we're, we're usually monitoring how the progress is going. So the person started at quite a high elevated state, and during the de-escalation, we're hopefully bringing them down a little bit. If it doesn't appear to be working, then what I'd be considering doing is calling the code grey early, getting in there early, hitting that duress button early, 
because then I'm hoping the two or three minutes that it takes for the Code Grey team to assemble, then I'm going to be able to make a, an assessment of whether the de-escalation has started to work or whether it's still stuck. If the de-escalation's not working and we've already called the Code Grey, then the Code Grey team can come in and support before it gets out of control. So one of the options, one of the considerations is how soon are we going to call the Code Grey? We don't have to wait until the de-escalation has completely failed and then call it. We can call it during it if you don't believe that you're going to get a win. If you don't believe you can have a successful de-escalation, it would be okay to call the Code Grey then. When the Code Grey team assembles, then we've got an opportunity to keep that de-escalation going. Perhaps even just having the Code Grey team there will give that staff member the confidence to keep on going uh, and to manage the escalation. Another option is change the faces. Uh, if this person is still aggressive when I'm trying to de-escalate them, if I feel that this isn't working, then I'm more than happy to step out and let someone else come and take over. I think sometimes professional ego can get in the way of that and people stay in a little bit longer than they should. Another option, which I really like, is tactical disengagement. It's not working, step out. I can see this isn't good for you, Mrs. Jeffrey. I'm just going to step out and give you a couple of minutes and I'll come back and check on you. So that tactical disengagement, you close the door, you allow Mrs. Jeffrey the time to, to think through and hopefully de-escalate herself. But then also the staff member can be communicating with other staff members, with colleagues, and letting them know that something's happening and then coming up with plans of how it is we're going to deal with it. So the concern there would be that the person stays in longer than they should, rather than understanding that stepping out is absolutely an okay thing to do.